Good afternoon, and thanks for joining Washington, D.C.-based Jennifer Schausen Associates in our Get Far Sighted in 2020 complimentary webinar series. As you know, the FAR or Federal Acquisition Regulations is the rule book that the federal government must follow when making purchases. Our webinar series pulls from contracting experts to explain each part of the FAR. It is complimentary and recorded. We'll post all of the recordings on our website and YouTube channel where we have over 300 government contracting webinars available for download. A special thanks to our webinar partner in the series, the National Veterans Small Business Coalition Education Foundation. Please visit their website to learn more about the organization. We would also like to thank our friends at Open the FAR for their sponsorship. If you're interested in, in sponsoring the series or one part, please contact hello at jennifershouse.com. Now a bit about us. We work with primarily large businesses to help them navigate the federal marketplace. We work with both product and service companies as well as software firms. Our clients span the globe and include publicly traded organizations in a variety of sectors. We provide market analysis reports, contract administration, contract vehicle assistance, and more. All of our services can also be built into a training course for your team. Learn more about us on our website. And now we would like to let you know about some ways to reach government and government contractors through us. We offer advertising and sponsorship opportunities through our weekly newsletter and also in our webinar series. For, pri for pricing or to place an order, please email us at hello at jennifershouse.com. Also, please join us for our signature event on February 10th <clears throat> at the Kennedy Center. U.S. State Department will be available to meet with you. We expect 150 federal contractors and hope to see you there. Now let's move on to learn a bit about today's speaker, Mark Snyderman. You can find his contact information on the screen. And today we're covering FAR Part 6. Thank you, Mark, for joining us today. Uh, thank, we're thankful for your participation. Uh, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity, and thanks to Jennifer Schaltz for putting on this great series. Uh, it's really important to have a holistic understanding of what the FAR is uh, and how it works uh, in order to work in government contracting. So uh, I think this series uh, is really important for everyone. I uh, hope you enjoy uh, hearing about FAR Part 6 competition requirements. Uh, next slide, please. So let's just an uh, overview of what we're going to do today. We're going to talk through the different sections of FAR Part 6. Uh, 6.1 is full and open competition. Uh, 6.2, full and open competition after exclusion of sources. 6.3, other than full and open competition. 6.4, sealed bidding. 6.5, advocates for competition. Next slide, please. Like I said, it's, it's really important to sort of get a, a holistic uh, view of what we're looking at. And there's really two overarching theories uh, in the FAR on competition. One is that competition will promote the public interest. Uh, and second, that competition will yield value. So those are really the drivers uh, behind when the FAR was written uh, in order to understand, you know, sort of what, what were they thinking uh, when they wrote the, this this uh long section on competition and try to carve out some rules as to how we would look at it. Next slide, please. A lot of it's based on what's in what's called, uh, you might have heard the term SECA, which is the Competition and Contracting Act, which was passed in 1984. And Congress passed this in order to increase the competitive nature of government procurement. Uh, really what they were looking for was to promote, you know, economy, efficiency, effectiveness, uh, through the use of full and open competition uh, to the maximum extent possible. Now, not all contracts are subject to SECA, and the FAR is how SECA was implemented uh, within the GovCon industry. Uh, so what we're really looking for is transparency and competition. Uh, next slide, please. So like I said, not every contract is subject to SECA. So I'll give you a little graphic here on what's subject to SECA and what isn't. So on the right-hand side of your screen, you see in the blue uh, procurement contracts and what sub and a subset of procurement contracts are subject to SECA, the majority of them. What isn't subject to SECA is set aside and sole source contracts. Uh, and then there's what we call sort of non-procurement contracts, which are not subject to SECA at all. Uh, a good example of that is other transaction authority, OTAs. Uh, and I know that uh, Jen Schaus had some I think maybe next week there's a uh, webinar series on OTAs, and you can certainly look those up on her uh, great database and you, on YouTube of vehicles that are out there. Uh, next slide, please. 
So I wanted to sort of give you a high level of understanding of competition post SICA, because uh, you have uh, this increased competition. Uh, the, the goal is, you know, to increase competition through full and open in, in the 80s when SICA comes out. Uh, and we like to say that the pendulum has swung uh, multiple times over the years, right, in terms of how competitive the market becomes and what's allowable. So in 1994, we see less competition because the Federal Acquisition Streamlining Act comes about, uh, and that sets out the rules for commercial acquisitions. It increases the use of IDIQs, sets out simplified acquisitions. So competition starts to actually wane during the 90s. Uh, and it gets reinvigorated in 2008 with the with the National Defense Authorization Act when they reinvigorated IDIQ competition. Uh, and this continues uh, in the 2011 memo from Shay Assad with the procurement, uh, the assistant secretary of, of, I think, of under defense and logistics at, at the Pentagon. Uh, it's a pretty famous memo if you've read it. Uh, and what it says is, you know, it basically started to uh, increase competition even more by saying, if there's only one bid, uh, we're going to do even heavier review of the cost and pricing. So it really started to slow down the process. Uh, and we've seen, you know, increased competition from that point through the Obama administration. Uh, and in 2019, we start to see uh, another pendulum swing uh, back towards less competition. Uh, as we look at the Section 8, 809 panel, uh, which looked to simplify some of the acquisition, uh, there's shortened time frames in trying to get things done, uh, and GSA is, is really moving into more of the e-commerce type activity, uh, so we can, so competition begins to reduce again. Next slide, please. So we have three levels of competition that are set out in the FAR, uh, which I've said before, 6.1 is full and open, 6.2 is full and open after exclusion of sources, and 6.3 is other than full and open. Uh, the, the underlying principle of the FAR, which comes out of SICA, is that agencies must achieve competition to the maximum extent possible within each level of competition. So if you look at a full and open competition after exclusion of sources, they still need to seek competition whenever they can. So sole source is the, you know, sort of the holy grail for most of us as a, as a contractor, but from the far side, from the government side, they want to they want to avoid that as much as possible so that they can increase competition, which arguably increases transparency and price and all the good stuff. Next slide. So full and open competition is where all responsible sources are permitted to compete, and this is under FAR subpart 6.1. So contracting officers will provide for full and open competition by using competition procedures to solicit offers and awards and award contracts unless they can justify using full and open after exclusion or other than full and open. So essentially, if you read the, as this reads, this is the default. The default should be we're going to move, we're going to use full and open. Uh, and contracting officers must use the competitive procedures that is best suited for the particular contract action. Next slide. So examples of competitive procedures that are promote full and open are uh, such things as sealed bids, and that will be discussed when you get to FAR 14. Uh, competitive proposals, which, you know, has negotiation in it, which is FAR Part 15. Uh, there's a co You can combine competitive procedures, like a two-step sealed bid, or, or there's other types of competitive procedures, like the federal supply schedule. So all, the, all these items are, you know, examples of what types of competitive procedures are out there for full and open competition. Next slide. So full and open competition after exclusion of sources uh, is when SICA provided for instances where there would be a competition which excluded certain participants. So most of us have heard of set-asides for uh, small business, maybe for small and disadvantaged business, SDVOSB, uh, and under FAR subpart 6.2, contracting officers are allowed under limited circumstances, they can exclude one or more sources from a particular contract action. So, and then after they exclude the sources, the competition becomes full and open amongst the non-excluded sources. So again, what we see is the the driver in the FAR is in, is competition to the most extent possible. So where we have where we're going to limit who's allowed in, into the into the game, 
uh, we're still going to make sure that anybody that's in that game uh, can compete with one another fairly and uh, under transparent rules. Next slide. So there's two instances where a contracting officer can uh, set this can do set aside. Uh, they're either establishing or maintaining alternative sources for supplies or services, or they're setting aside for small business. And that's uh, the FAR references are provided 6.202 or 6.203. Uh, next slide. So establishing or maintaining an alternative source has to fall within one of the following six exclusions. So this is in turn, this is in essence, how can the government set aside work? And, you know, from a practical standpoint, uh, for those in the contracting industry, what we're looking to do is, uh, obviously there's, there's sort of a, it's, a, it's, a, it's one part is against the other, right? So the, the government wants to increase competition to the most extent possible. And for those in the GovCon industry, obviously you're looking to try to limit competition whenever possible so that you have a better chance of, like, of likelihood of success uh, to, to win the work. So when you're trying to help the uh, acquisition planning, you want to look to see, is there a way that you could possibly exclude some sources and, you know, move the, move the acquisition into something that, you know, is more favorable for your position. So here's the six exclusions uh, that, that, are, that are important to know. Uh, one, increase or maintain competition, and it's likely to reduce in the overall cost of the acquisition. Uh, two, it could be in the interest of national defense in having facilities, producers, manufacturers, other suppliers available for national emergency or industrial mobilization. Uh, it could be in the interest of national defense in establishing or maintaining an essential engineering research and development capability provided by an educational or a nonprofit institution or a federally funded research and development corporation. Next slide. Where we could be establishing or maintaining alternative sources such as uh, ensuring continuous availability of reliable source, uh, satisfying projected needs based on the history of high demand, uh, satisfying a critical need for medical safety or emergency supplies, uh, and in order to do uh, a full and open competition after exclusion, the agency head has to sign off on a DNF, which is FAR 6.202B1. And you, you can see, uh, if you go to the FAR, you can actually see samples of what the, the language of what's needed to be included in the DNF, uh, which is provided by the government. Uh, and, you know, in terms of acquisition planning, a lot of this discussion and which, which one of these exclusions is included is, is utilized. Uh, would be discussed at that time. Next slide, please. So set asides for small business uh, are different, right? Because they don't—they actually don't require the DNF. Uh, the contracting officer can set aside an acquisition exclusively for participation by small business concerns. Uh, and what that what what, what drives that is uh, what is called the rule of two. And you'll learn about the rule of two. Uh, when you get to FAR Part 19, uh, Section 19.505-2 talks about how if there are two sources that are small businesses that can accomplish the work at a reasonable price, uh, then the contracting officer can set that acquisition aside exclusively for small business. And there's additional small business set-aside guidance in FAR 6.2, uh, and a lot of these are you know, sort of the set of the traditional set asides we hear about. 6.204 talks about how to set aside work for 8A. 6.205 uh, provides for hub zone set asides. 6.206 for SDVOSB for veteran owned businesses. And then there's 6.207, which is for local firms during a major disaster or emergency. So in the event of a hurricane or significant, uh, natural disaster, there may be local firms that are available to use and they want to move quickly and efficiently to get work done and the government could set aside work so that only those companies could participate, uh, which obviously makes a lot of sense in the terms of, you know, even though we're driving for competition uh, in an emergency, you'd want to be able to move a lot quicker. Next slide, please. 
that that that's basically the requirements for other that for the full and open composition and then full and open composition with set aside. Uh, and now we're going to talk about other than full and open composition, which is FAR subpart 6.3. Uh, so agencies cannot contract without providing a full and open composition unless they can re they can show a statutory ex uh, exception from 6.302. And, and these are the 6.302 exceptions that exist. One, there's only one responsible source and no other supplies or services can satisfy agency requirements. Two, there's an unusual or compelling urgency. So wartime, you may see... Uh, other than full and open competition where they set aside where it could be a sole source because of a compelling urgency need uh, within the war. Uh, industrial mobilization, engineering, developmental, research capability, or expert services. So similar to what we saw earlier in subpart 2, 6.2, uh, where work can be set aside for uh, nonprofits or FFRDCs doing specific engineering and developmental research. Uh, there is possibility to do other than full and open competition uh, for research. Uh, OTAs typically fall under this type of category, where the the work is being is other transaction authority separate agreements uh, with the government for research and prototyping. Also, international agreement uh, or required or authorized by statute. Uh, of course, national security and public interest are always put in here uh, in within the FAR so that there are exceptions to the competitive rules and to, to, in order to be able to uh, accomplish goals in wartime exigency or other urgent circumstances. Next slide. And 6.302 requires uh, what we call a JNA, a justification and approval. Uh, that has to be in writing in its very specific requirements. And in 6.302-2B, you can see those what those requirements look like. Uh, and just from a practical standpoint, a JNA is a significant piece of work for customers and 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 contracts. Uh, they typically do market research uh, to ensure the JNA will pass will pass by. Uh, and approvals are based on dollar levels. So uh, as the level of dollars uh, look to, that are looked to be set aside increase, the level of requirement for a signature increases. Right, so it could just be if it's you know a certain level, it's only contracts. At the next level, it goes to the the small business advocates, and at the next level, you get to senior procurement officials, where you're looking for uh, high-level Pentagon officials to sign off on competition on on a on an acquisition to show why it should be non-competitive. So these become more difficult in terms of the practicality of obtaining this type of uh, acquisition work. So that's why OTA is one of the favorite sons within the other than full and open competition, since it already has the justifications completed in order to have the, the OTAs in place. Next slide, please. So for 6.4 is sealed bids and competitive proposals, and sealed bids are to be sought by the contracting officer whenever uh, the time permits the solicitation, submission, and evaluation of sealed bids. Uh, the award will be made on the basis of price and other related factors. Uh, it's not necessary to conduct discussions with the responding offerers about their bids. Uh, and there's a reasonable expectation of receiving more than one sealed bids. Uh, competitive proposals can be used whenever sealed bids are not appropriate. And that's a, that 6.4 is a very small section of the FAR, but pretty critical to understand uh, when are they going to be using sealed bids, and when are they looking to use competitive proposals? Uh, next slide. And the last section that we need to talk about uh, in terms of FAR uh, competitive competition and requirements in FAR Part 6 uh, are competition advocates, which are uh, designated from FAR 6.5. Uh, and the head of each agency that is required to designate a competition ad advocate for the agency itself uh, the competition advocate's job is generally to promote the acquisition of commercial items uh, and use full and open competition as well as understand and, and break down those challenge, challenge barriers to competition. Uh, the competition advocate sets goals and plans for acquisition strategy, provides reporting to senior pro procurement officials on metrics, 
So we see a lot of, uh, there's a lot of metrics that are involved and GAO does reporting on these. Uh, and each year we look to see how much, how much work was set aside for small business, uh, how much work is flowing through IDIQs and task orders, uh, and task order type contracting. So that's the, the basis for, uh, for part six. And, uh, that's really the overview that I have for you today. Uh, I hope it's been helpful in understanding uh, the basics of competition and what drives uh, a lot of what's in the FAR uh, is is from the fact that we are looking to have competition within the market and uh, how can you maybe use the, some of these rules to your advantage as a contractor uh, in order to try to shape some acquisition strategy to help maybe limit competition in certain instances so that you have a better leg up uh, as you go seek out new business. Thank everybody for their time uh, and thank you for joining me. My contact information is on the screen. Uh, it's mark at snydermanlawgroup.com. Uh, my cell phone's there. Uh, feel free to give me a call, give me an email, uh, and thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Mark, for a great presentation. Uh, as you said, uh, the contact information is on the screen there. And if you have any questions about federal contractor and need assistance with any of our services, please contact us directly. Thank you again for joining us today, and this concludes the webinar.